You know, it's an interesting thing about the Sfaradim that um, we never developed these, these differences. And the truth is that, that it's the case, not just with our community, but pretty much around the world. Even the Western Sfaradim, the Spanish and Portuguese, which I, you know, I'm, I'm leading now in, in, in England, there is no such idea you know, of, of these divisions. I think there's, you know, there's many reasons for it. Um, but no, I don't think that we're, we're looking to try and fit into a particular model. Uh, that's actually been something that has been our legacy. We've always looked at Torah, the Sfaradim, I've always looked at Torah as Torah, and how close I am, involved I am, in terms of my participation may be varied, but the Sfaradim have always recognized that as part of the nature of Klal Yisrael. You know, there are people that are closer, there are people that are further, but the standard of Torah has always been the standard. And so the question really is a matter of education. And the inclusiveness has always been a hallmark of our people. So no matter how close or far a person is in terms of their observance, there is an acceptance in general in terms of the community, almost everywhere in the world. The question is education. So I wouldn't uh, so much think about responding in terms of what model do we want to look at. More important, I believe, is a question of how are we educating? And to what level are we educating? Uh, and that's really where everything lies. It's the key to everything. You know, I, I, uh, there's one story that keeps coming up in my mind, thinking about, you know, talking about the future and how it is that we're, we're going to move forward. And I, I was teaching Sunday mornings about six, seven years ago, Morene Buchim. And I had one older man who was always coming to the, to the shiur, and he, he told me a story about his grandson and his son. So his grandson was wearing pajamas with dinosaurs on them. And it was a very traditional family, for lack of a better term. And, uh, you know, his grandfather turns to his grandson and he says, Oh, you know, Moshe, you're, you're wearing dinosaurs on your pajamas. And his son comes running into the room and says, Dad, Dad, don't say that. He said, What's the matter? He goes, I, I told him they're dogs. <laughs> and, you know, the question is, that's the bigger question. Can we create, our, our, you know, as far as Faradim are concerned, our community is our community. We embrace everybody. But how are we going to move forward in terms of, in terms of the future? I know, I'm sure that there are many people in this room, uh, and I know that I'm, you know, I, I had this experience growing up as well, that to some degree we have to, we have to hang our reality at the door when we want to go speak to a religious leader, a religious thinking person. I mean, am I alone in that? Has anybody felt that? So that's the issue that, that I think is most pertinent that we have to address. Um, and we should bank on the fact and build on the fact that as far as the Sfaradim are concerned, we are less concerned with what box we're in and more concerned and should be more concerned about what level of education are we instilling in the, in the community and our people. Thank you. Denise, I want to ask, answer you by stepping back and looking at the panoply of Jewish history. Some of the world's greatest empires set themselves to attack either Jews or Judaism. Every one of those was the superpower of its day. Egypt of the Pharaohs, Babylon, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the empire of Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, the medieval empires of Christianity and Islam, all the way up to the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. Every one of them seemed to bestride the narrow world like a colossus. Every one of those has been consigned to history. And our tiny vulnerable people can still stand and say, Am Yisrael Chai. However, three times in our history, we lost our land, our home, and went into exile. The first time, Joseph and his brothers going to Egypt. The second time, the Khurban Bayit Rishon, the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile, and the third time in the days of Rome. All three times for the same reason. Joseph and his brothers, Lo Yachlu Dabro Shalom. There was a division within the family. They couldn't talk peaceably with one another. In the case of the first temple, after only three kings, Saul, David, and Shlomo HaMelech, the kingdom divided in two, 
and as another Abraham, not Avram Avinu, but Avram Lincoln, said, a house divided against itself cannot stand, and therefore the northern kingdom conquered by the Babylonians, the southern, uh, by the Assyrians, and the southern by the Babylonians. When it came to the Roman siege of Jerusalem, Josephus tells us that the Jews inside Jerusalem were more intent on fighting one another than they were on the enemy outside. In other words, the biggest empires couldn't defeat us, but we managed to defeat ourselves. There is only one nation on earth that can threaten the Jewish people, and that is the Jewish people. So never allow ourselves to become divided. Those divisions began in the 19th and 20th centuries. Germany produced reform and then conservative Judaism and took it here to the States. Uh, Eastern Europe divided between religious and secular and took it to Israel. And so American Jewry and Israeli Jewry is deeply divided. There are only two groups that never went that way. One of them was the sort of Anglo-Jewish model that I call inclusive orthodoxy, which you also find in Italian Jewry, French Jewry, South Africa, Australian. And the other one is the Sephardi community. Those two remained inclusive communities. And that is how Hashem wants us to be. You know, we pray every, every Yamim Norahim, V'ye asu kulam aguda achat, make all of us into one unified band. And the truth is that the more open a community is to diversity, the bigger it becomes, the richer, the more diverse. So I want to say never go down that route to division. Just be very, be very honest, be blunt with ourselves. It took four generations for the world of Islam to divide between Sunni and Shia. It took, <clears throat> you know, in the 16th, after the Reformation, 1517, European Christianity split into Protestant and Catholic. The result was wars, violence, murder, destruction. God forbid that we should ever be so divided from one another that we don't see ourselves as one people. So never go down that Ashkenazi road of division. Just forget it. We have that on. What? We have that recorded? Uh, please, just don't follow us, okay?